God. Amen. We are doing a verse by verse study of the book of Ephesians. What we normally do in this ministry, we take one book of the Bible and we start from the first chapter and we will explain the Word of God. We, we don't really rush through the Bible. We don't really take one verse from one particular book. For instance, a lot of preachers, they will just take one verse that deals with prosperity and they will concentrate on that verse and other preachers might just take a couple verses that deal with um, healing and stuff like that and they will just concentrate on verses in the Bible that deals with um, healing or prosperity or faith. But what we choose to do in this ministry, we want to study the Bible verse by verse. The Bible tells us that we must take line upon line, here a little and there a little. And uh, if you have a desire to have an understanding of the Word of God, the best way to understand the Word of God is to take one book and you take your time and read and try to understand. You know, it's no use trying to rush it through. Some people want to um, read maybe three chapters a day. That is okay if you can retain what you are reading. But uh, the best way to read the Word of God is very slow. Just like what um, the doctors will tell us when we eat our food, you chew it slowly. And uh, that's the way we ought to um, read and meditate on the Word of God. So that's what we are doing here in this ministry. We go verse by verse with uh, the Scripture and we try to understand what the Lord is saying to us. So today we find ourselves in he- uh, sorry, Ephesians chapter 5. Praise the Lord. We bow our heads in prayer. Eternal Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your faithfulness. God, we thank you because you are good and you are kind and you are compassionate. You are loving. You are caring for us. You care for us, O oh God, as a father. We are your children. We are your sons and daughters. And even as we find ourselves in your house today, Father, we pray that you feed us with manna from above. It is not your will that any should perish, but all should have life and have life more abundantly. Lord, even as I stand here and minister your words today, I pray that the Holy Spirit will use your words, O oh God, to touch the hearts of your people. And Lord, you will shine your light upon us. The light that shines in darkness. The Lord Jesus Christ will illuminate the hearts of some individual here today. Someone who have not known the Lord Jesus as Lord and Savior. God, they will come to repentance even as we share your words. Bless us, we pray, in Jesus' precious, wonderful name. Glory to God. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5. It tells us, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Now here we see the Apostle Paul. This is Paul the Apostle. He is explaining here to the Ephesian church. And he's saying to them, Be ye followers of God as dear children. Now we know physically, in a family Children will mimic their parents. Children will do exactly what they see their parents doing. If you have your kids and your kids hear you swearing, if they see you drinking, someone was telling me about this uh, little girl that they're working with babysitting, and I guess uh, the, the, the little girl saw their parents, her parents, drinking beer from the bottle and from the, the can, and when the parents finish drinking the beer, put it down, she will go around and she will drain every can and every beer bottle that she can get her hands on. Why? Because she's mimicking her father, mimicking her mom. And uh, that is what Paul is saying here. That when we become children of God, the Bible tells us, but as many as receive him, to them gave he power to become sons and daughters of God. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God is expecting us to mimic Him or to be like Him. And we have the perfect example in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God sent His only begotten Son, as John 3, 16 tells us, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So Jesus, he was the perfect example for us. So if you're looking for someone to mimic, 
The person that we are to mimic is the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to live like Him. Uh, Jesus, He said when He was here, He said, I am the light of the world. But when He was uh, uh, about to leave to go back to His Father's kingdom, He said to His disciples, Ye are the light of the world. And He said that we must let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. So just like a, a child will mimic their parents, we must mimic our Father, our Heavenly Father. Those of us who are born again, those of us who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, God is expecting us to mimic Him. Now those who don't know Christ as their Lord and Savior, it means that they will not be able to mimic Him because they are not true children of God. But God don't he, he doesn't really close the door on any individual. It is still the will of God that all men, all women should be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So if you are here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this will be the appropriate time for you to trust Jesus, to put your trust in Him, to call upon Him. The Bible said, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. You don't have to wait until next week. Somebody might say, well, oh, there's not a lot of people here. I am going to wait until we have a full church. You don't need to wait until you have a full church. You can accept the Lord at any time. Because the Bible tells us, as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after death there comes the judgment. We don't know when our time is going to come. You know, your time could come at any time. You don't have to be old. You know, you can be as young as you can be and your time could be up. So that's the reason why when we hear the message of salvation, God is giving us an opportunity to change our life, to trust Him, to turn to Him. So Paul is saying that true children of God will mimic their father. And he said, as dear children... So he's saying that if you are a true child of God, if you are a bona fide child of God, you are going to mimic the Lord. Your life is going to be changed. The Bible said any man who is in Christ is a new creature. If you are a Christian, you must live a different life in comparison to the people of the world. We cannot call upon the name of the Lord, confess the name of the Lord, and live as the unsaved. We must live a life that is pleasing in the sight of God. So if you are a child of God, your life is going to reflect the Lord Jesus Christ. You are going to live like Him. The Bible said, be perfect, even as our Heavenly Father is perfect. So we, when we are born again, we become dear children, beloved children. We are love of God. We are dear sons and daughters of God, and God expects us to mimic Him, to live like Him. Verse 2, He said, and walk in love. Now what this is talking about, the word they walk, is not talking about uh, Andre who is walking up to the front here. <laughs> he, uh, the, the word walk in the New Testament, it is your lifestyle, your conduct. The way you conduct yourself, the way you live, the way you operate. And when you see, the, especially in New Testament, in the epistle, Paul talk about walk. And what he's saying is that we have to live a life of love. Why we must live a life of love? Because he just called on us here to mimic the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was a person who was living a life of love. So God is love. If we are his children, if we are bona fide sons and daughters of God, we must walk in love. We must mimic our Father by loving um, our brothers and our sisters. You know, there's no sense in talking love. A lot of times people will talk love, but they don't act love. Love must be in action. You've got to put it in, in action. You can't just talk about it. You know, it is useless to talk about loving others if you are not acting in a loving way towards them. So we have to act love. We have to walk in love. Praise the Lord. The Bible said that love will cover a multitude of sins. 
You know, it is so good that when a person has the agape love, the love of God generating within their heart, it doesn't matter what bad someone may do to you, you still have that strength and you have that love and you have that courage that you can still reach out to them and you can forgive them, you know, and you can let bygone be bygone and you just move on in a spirit of love. It is not a good thing to have animosity in our heart. If somebody do, do you something wrong, you talk to them about it. The Bible gives us the direction how we are to go about addressing these things. Somebody offend you, a brother offend you, a sister offend you, a friend offend you. You're supposed to go to that person and talk to them. If they are members of a church and they don't listen to you, you need to take two or three more brothers and sisters and go to them and talk to them. If they don't listen to you the third time, you get uh, the elders of the church and you talk to them. And then if they don't listen to the elders of the church, it means that this person is a rebellious person. Then you can take the action and you can dis, uh, fellowship them from the congregation. But when people do us wrong, we must reach out to them so that we can embrace them and we can heal whatever wounds is in the relationship. So God is calling us to walk in love as, and he said, as Christ also loved us. We are love of Christ. The Lord Jesus loved us. And uh, it doesn't matter who you are today, God loves you. Even though you may not be loved by others, and sometimes people might be reaching out and they crying out for love. A lot of times you in relationship, husbands crying out for love, um, wives crying out for love. But here we see, it doesn't matter how starved you might be of love, there is someone who loves us. Every one of us. And that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. So he said that Jesus loves us, and uh, 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 as Christ has loved us, he said, and had given himself for us an offering. The Lord Jesus gave himself for us. And what this is saying is that Jesus, when he died on the cross of Calvary, Jesus did not die for himself. Jesus was sinless. The Lord Jesus, he sacrificed his life on our behalf. He presented himself, you know, as an offering when he died on the cross of Calvary. He offered up himself as a sacrifice. You know, when you sacrifice something, it means that, you know, it's like, I want you to get a picture of this. You take a, an animal, you take a sheep, and you put the knife to the throat, you cut the throat, put, them, put that animal on the altar, put wood and fire, and the animal is consumed. That is what he's is, is talking about, the sacrifice. Jesus was the sacrificial Lamb of God when he died on the cross of Calvary. John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus come into him to be baptized, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. He is that spotless Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And it is, it is the sin of you and I, every one of us that is here today. Jesus died for your sin. But for you to receive the benefit of what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, you must first acknowledge that you are a sinner in the sight of God and you confess your sins. The Bible said if we confess our sins, He the Lord is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us away from all unrighteousness. You don't need to confess to a man. You don't need to confess to the priest. The priest needs to confess to God. We all need to confess to God. You know, even though you go and you confess to a, to a priest and he said, well, you know, go home and, and do two or uh, three Holy Marys or whatever they call it and whatever he tells you to do. Your sins is not forgiven by you going and saying whatever uh, Hail Mary you have to say. That does not eradicate our sins. Our sins is only removed when we go to God and we ask Him to forgive us. When you go to God and you confess to Him and you ask Him to forgive you, even though the priest don't give you um, His blessing, you are forgiven of God because God is the only one who can forgive sin. Man cannot forgive sin. Man cannot forgive sins. Praise the Lord. So the Lord Jesus presents himself as a, a sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. 
And whatever we are giving to God, it's going to cost us something. If you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ today, it is going to cost you something. It's not going to be an easy thing. Living for God is not an easy thing. You know, sometimes we invite people to come to the Lord to receive Jesus, and we give them the impression that everything is going to just be rosy from here on. That is not the truth. When you give your life to the Lord Jesus, it is a sacrifice. Yes, and in the Old Testament, remember when Moses was sent by God to go to Pharaoh to ask him to let the children of Israel go free. Moses went into Pharaoh and in, uh, Pharaoh did not let Israel go free. But what he did, he intensified the burden that was upon the nation of Israel. So when we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, um, we, must be expe- we are going to be expected to make sacrifice. And the Lord Jesus, He makes sacrifice. He sacrificed Himself on our behalf on the cross of Calvary. And the Bible said what? In, at the end of this verse, verse 2, to God for a sweet smelling savor. And what that is saying is that when Jesus presented Himself on the cross of Calvary, He was, uh, His body was a fragrant offering. His body ascended up to God, the smell of his sacrifice goes up to heaven into the nostril of God as a sweet smelling savor. It gives off a fragrance. It's like you perfume yourself in the nostril of God when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. The offering was a sweet fragrance in God's nostril. In uh, um, Genesis, the Bible tells us that sin was increased upon the face of the earth. And the stench of sin, the smell of sin, it went up into the nostril of God. And the rod of God descend upon the earth. And the Lord caused a flood to be poured out upon the earth. And He destroyed the whole world because of the smell, the wickedness that was taking place upon the earth back there. But here we see when Jesus came and He died on the cross of Calvary, in spite of the fact that there was wickedness in the world, the, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross of Calvary ascended to the Father, and it was a sweet smelling savor in the nostril of God. In closing, um, it said, but fornication. So, Paul is telling us here that we have to mimic our Father. And what he's saying is that if you are a child of God, you are not expected to be a fornicator. A fornicator is a person who is living in um, adultery, living a, a life of uh, fornication. It is two unmarried persons having sexual relationship with each other. That is what fornication is all about in the, the basic state. But um, in an overall state, all um, illicit re- relationship, all sexual relationship outside of marriage in the sight of God, is considered to be fornication. When two people have in sexual relationship together and they are not married, what about Bible is saying that they don't have a license? And they'll pick up his license yesterday. And I guess uh, last night, I guess things was okay with him, so he could have used his license last night. So uh, in God's eyes, for you to be eligible to legally have sexual relationship where God is concerned. You must have that license. And that license when you go before the proper authority and you come before the witnesses in the presence of God and you declare your love for each other and stuff like that. But having sexual relationship just by um, shacking up with somebody it is not, um, it is a sin in the sight of God. And that can cause the wrath of God to descend upon any person. So we must abstain from that kind of lifestyle. And all uncleanness, so anything that is uh, where sex is concerned outside of marriage, God consider it to be unclean. Adultery, you know, um, double timing and all of these kind of things, you know, sleeping around, all of that kind of lifestyle, God consider that to be uncleanness. He said, or covetousness. What that is, what, what the, the covetousness here is a person who already has something. For instance, you already have 
your wife and you are looking at another woman, that also is considered to be covetousness. Uh, you have your, your husband and you're still eyeing another man. That is considered to be covetousness. And God is saying that these things, once you become a child of God, you have to lay that aside. You have to put that up on the shelf. That has to be the past life. Praise the Lord. Let it not be once named among you as become a saint. So um, what Paul is saying, you are not even supposed to commit um, a sexual relationship outside of your marriage, not even one time. You're not even allowed to have one little fling. When you become married, when you, you know, uh, are in a relationship with a person and you um, become legally married, God is saying here that you are not even supposed to have a little fling. Not even a little fling. You've got to be tr- totally faithful, totally committed in that relationship. And when we commit ourselves in marriage like that, God, He has no alternative but to bless us. Anytime you dedicate yourself to a person, you commit yourself to a person, it doesn't matter who comes along. You know, that, this is not to say that you're not going to see people who you admire. You know, I'm a married man. I married for much um, 30 something years. How much is that? Um, honey? <laughs> we were married in 1979. So that is about what? 33 years. I guess going on 34 years. Yes, I see lovely women. You know, I admire ladies. But I know I have my main squeeze at home. You know, so I am not uh, craving for nobody else because I know that's a sin. So when we dedicate, when a man or woman dedicate themselves to each other, they, God is expecting them to live a life of faithfulness, commit themselves to each other, and God, He is going to bless you. Your life is going to be blessed. Praise God. Amen. We are going to stop there for today. And next week, God's willing, we are going to pick up You see, as I said, we are doing verse-by-verse teaching. So when we come to these hard subjects, you know, sometimes you hear people say, well, I don't like to hear the pastor talk about this. Let him mind his own business. This is my business. I cannot skip these things. You know, some preacher will just, uh, this is a hard thing. If I talk about this to the congregation, they're going to get upset. Maybe next week we're not going to get a good offering. So the pastor might just skip over that verse and he go lower down where there's a more palatable verse a scripture and he talk about that. But we have to understand that we can't do that because if you do that as a preacher, God is going to hold you accountable. So you don't skip over when you come to the hard things. You have to just deal with it and we accept it because it is the word of God. God bless us. Uh, we will sing a closing song as we bring our time of fellowship to an end today. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you feel impressed by the Holy Spirit to make a commitment to Him, at the end of this song, you can come to the altar and give your life to the Lord, and we will have a prayer with you, and then bring our service to a close. Praise the Lord. Uh, We'll sing, um, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. Glory to God. I'm going to ask all of our um, visiting friends, our family members, come up to the altar. I can't let you leave without prayer, have a prayer for you. Praise God. Everybody that is visiting, because uh, I think maybe next week some of you leaving to go back. So we need to pray. We need to have a prayer that God could give you a safe passage back. Praise the Lord. You know, as I pray, you can talk to God in your own way, tell him whatever you want to tell him. Praise God. Amen. And he is going to listen to you. But I'm going to have a prayer over you and let the Lord have his way. Um, Praise God. Uh, Members of the congregation, just stand behind them in agreement as I pray for them. Praise God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Father, we thank you today for your words. Thank you because your word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged, uh, every two-edged sword, and we praise you for the power of your words today. God, in the name of Jesus, as we are here before your throne, Lord, we know your hand is not shortened, that it cannot save your ears, are not heavy, that it cannot hear. Lord, we pray today in the name of Jesus that you will hear our prayer, 
Father, even as we approach you on the behalf of all of our family members that is visiting us today, O oh God, Lord, for the marriage, their father, that took place yesterday. And, O oh God, we enjoy their presence. And, Father, we commit them into your hands. Lord, that you will watch over them. Lord, as they prepare to go back to their homeland, their place of abode, that you will guide them. Father, we pray for safe passage. We pray that your hands will be upon the pilot and the co-pilot. Lord, that you'll take them to their destination safely. In the name of Jesus, Lord, those who may be sick in their bodies, those who may be, oh God, suffering with some kind of disease, Lord, that they probably have a bad word from the doctor. In Jesus' name, Lord, we speak a word of healing. Lord Jesus, you was wounded for transgression. Bruised for our iniquity, the chastisement of our peace was upon you. And by your stripes we are healed. In the mighty name of Jesus, even as they stand before you today, I pray that you switch on your, oh God, your search light, Lord. And Father God, search their hearts. And Lord, those who might be suffering, Lord, different diseases within their body, oh God, whatever complaint they might be experiencing in their body. You are our family doctor. And I pray that the anointing of God, the anointing that will break the yoke, the burden removing yoke, destroying power of God, will descend upon them at this time, Lord. And we pray that the yoke will be broken in Jesus' name. Glory be to God. Lord, even those who may be living under the fear, O oh God of death, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we break the fear of death, Satan. You are a liar in Jesus' name. Lord, we come against whatever disease, oh God, Lord, cancer, Lord, in Jesus' name, we come against it. Whatever tumor, we come against it in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray that it will be cursed, it will be rooted up in the name of Jesus. Every tumor that might be taking place, oh God, or taking root within any individual that is before the altar today, I pray that it will be rooted up in the name of Jesus. We command it to die in Jesus' name. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. I pray, O oh God, that you'll just show them your salvation. Glory be to God. Lord, even, O oh God, sister Virginia, who have her two sisters, or oh, uh, sister and daughter, O oh God, that is suffering, O oh God, Lord, over in Tartola, we remember them, Lord God, that, O oh God, their, 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 oh God, their condition, O oh God, it doesn't matter how much it might deteriorate. Oh God, that one Lord that is, she, she is on the deathbed, Lord, just waiting for time. God, you can change the situation. Lord, we remember her today in the name of Jesus. And we remember her daughter, oh God, Lord, who is going through similar affliction. Oh God, I pray that the curse will be broken. The, the curse of sickness will be broken in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh God, we stand in agreement. I stand in agreement, Lord, on the behalf of the family in Jesus' name. God, you said that you are looking for a man who will stand in the gap. And I stand in the gap today. And we put an end, oh God, Lord. We put an end. We call for an end of the reign of death, oh God, over the family. In the name of Jesus, oh God, we ask for mercy. Over the last couple of years, oh God, there are so many deaths. Oh God, we remember, oh God, so many deaths, oh God, one after the other. We cry out to you, Lord, for mercy. We cry out to you for mercy. God, I pray, oh God, that the blanket will be lifted. Whatever blanket the enemy tries to put over the family, Lord, we pray it will be lifted in the name of Jesus. Oh, glory be to God. And your blessings, oh God, will come over the family. The blessings of God that make it rich and added no sorrow with it. It will come over the family today in Jesus' name. God, lift their spirit, Lord. Lift their spirit, their Father. Rebuke the spirit of, of death. Rebuke the spirit of fear in the name of Jesus. Those who might be fearful, oh God, they are at a tender age. They are at a young age. And oh God, they are fearful of, about, about death because of this so, oh God, death take. Oh God, authority over certain members in the family. God, remove the fear of death from them, Lord. Let them live comfortable in the name of Jesus, trust in you. Know that you are more than able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above everything that we should ask or think by the power of God working in us. Let the power of God work within them today. 
Father, electrify them today. Oh God, I pray that you just give them a boost today. Energize them today in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Bless us all, Lord. Lord, even those who didn't make it today. Pray for Andel and Ariane, Lord, as they head out on their honeymoon. Bless them, Father. Guide them, keep them, protect them. Lord, remember all of the brethren who are not here today because they are tired, Lord. Remember them, their Father. I pray that you renew their strength. And, oh God, as we are about to leave here, go with us. Be with us throughout the course of this day. Bring us back at the appointed time. Bound in your spirit. We ask these favors in Jesus' precious, wonderful name.